Good evening. Thank you to Janet Pearson and the terrific staff of South by Southwest for choosing our film, The Hunt for Planet B, to premiere at this year's festival. Uh, we certainly wish we could be with you on stage in Austin, but we're glad to be with you here virtually. If you haven't seen The Hunt for Planet B, please check it out. It tells the story of NASA's new observatory, the Webb Telescope, the most complex space telescope ever built, which is due to launch later this year. Uh, and many people feel this promises to be really the space event of the decade. Um, but the film is not primarily about technology, it's about people, humanity, our hopes and curiosities, the challenges we face on our own planet. And central to the film is a question that has haunted us since the beginning of time. Are we alone in the universe? And um, we have with us tonight five scientists and engineers from the film, some of whom are involved with the telescope and all of whom are at the forefront of astronomy today. And they're driven, obsessed, and engaged in every way with looking for signs of life in the universe. Um, my filmmaking team and I have just loved working with this incredible, the incredible humans that you see in front of you. Uh, we have a very brief time with them tonight, so I'd now like to turn it over to them and ask each of them to please introduce themselves and tell you just briefly what they do. Um, if I could start with you, please, first, Jill, and then, um, so Jill Tarter, then Maggie Turnbull, then Natalie Batala, Sarah Seeger, and Amy Lowe. So starting with you, please, Jill. Thanks, Nathaniel. So my name is Jill Tarter, and I co-founded the SETI Institute in 1984. Um, for reasons that we were trying to save NASA money. And since then, uh, we have grown and we have many, many different scientists working on the question of life beyond Earth. And I've spent my career using telescopes around the world, looking for evidence of someone else's technology as a proxy for intelligence. Wonderful. So, and, and next, um, if Maggie, you would introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Turnbull. I work actually at the SETI Institute that Jill Tarter co-founded. Um, Jill was my PhD advisor in grad school. Um, but now I am a team lead for a science investigation team for the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which will launch in three to four years and has a, a special camera on it that will be able to take pictures of planets orbiting nearby stars in reflected starlight. Wonderful. And Natalie? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I'm Natalie Battaglia. Uh, I had a 20-year career at NASA Ames, where I was a science team lead for NASA's Kepler mission that found, well, the objective was to find out if planets like Earth are common or rare. When that minute mission finished, I moved back to academia, to UC Santa Cruz, where I'm the director of astrobiology. And I'm also the team lead of a project that's going to take some of the very first observations of exoplanets with the James Webb Space Telescope. That's called the Early Release Science Program. And Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Seeger. I'm a professor at MIT. And there I work on finding planets. I study their atmospheres. I'm working on the search for signs of life by way of gases that don't belong. And most recently, I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about Venus, including running a mission concept study about sending a series of small missions to Venus to search for signs of life or even life itself in the clouds of Venus. And Amy. With the James Webb Space Telescope behind you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Amy Lowe. Uh, I am part of the engineering team that is building the James Webb Space Telescope. I'm here in Redondo Beach, and uh, the Webb Telescope is about two buildings away and uh, a short walk, and I go take a look at it every day. Wonderful. Um, so I, I just want to dive right in and um, being the filmmaker, you see behind you, behind my my background is is the um, the the Trappist our visualization of the Trappist system or of 
uh, two of the planets of the Trappist system viewed from another planet of the Trappist system. Um, and it's a visualization we did for the film, The Hunt for Planet B. And of course, as a filmmaker, I wanna push here. We are on the verge of detecting life in the cosmos, right? Um, and I wanna ask Natalie, um, is that true? Are we indeed on the verge of detecting life in the cosmos? And, and how, does Webb how does the Webb telescope fit into that? Well, to, to answer your first question, I think absolutely we're on the verge of finding extant life. Um, and primarily by looking at exoplanets or these planets that are orbiting other stars. Kepler showed us that potentially habitable planets abound in the galaxy, that the nearest one is expected to be within just 10 light years. That helps us to design the next generation of missions of telescopes that, that, are, that will be capable of detecting evidence of life. And moreover, we're entering this new decade of exoplanet exploration with the James Webb Space Telescope, whereby we'll be able to detect the chemical fingerprints in the atmospheres of many planets, of hundreds of planets. So by doing that, we're going to learn a lot about the di great diversity of planets that we've identified, a diversity that we really don't know how to explain right now. We're going to flex our muscles and get stronger about how to interpret these chemical fingerprints in the atmospheres of planets. And as you've mentioned, uh, TRAPPIST-1 is really a unique case mm -hmm. of a planet, of, of a star that harbors seven terrestrial sized planets, three of which are temperate and could host life. So with TRAPPIST, we have this unique capability or potential to detect what we call a secondary atmosphere. This is an atmosphere that's potentially like Earth's or Venus's atmospheres. So that's very exciting and is going to open the gateway towards life detections in the future. Mm, it's wonderful. And I want to mention there's another battalia involved in this too. Um, Natasha Battaglia, who's in the film as well, uh, your daughter and an incredible scientist in her own right. And she, in fact, is studying um, on the team that's studying one of the TRAPPIST planets, TRAPPIST-1E, um, and the team, several members of the team, Nicole Lewis um, and Hannah Wakeford also are in the film. And um, so we, we get to see them too and see the next generation, which sort of brings me to the next question. And, and Sarah, I wanna ask you this, which is that one of the hardest things for me as a filmmaker to kind of come to terms with is that, or, or was difficult to observe in a way, is that for scientists, you know, you have your moment in, in, in history and you're in you sometimes you must struggle with the idea that a you know you you want the instruments to move faster come on get this finished come on let's get let's make these observations this is sort of you've spent your career on this and several of you here have spent your career on this this is sort of your moment in a sense like with web right now do you the stakes are high in a way do you are we close to finding life out there do you think we're going to find it in the next few years and does web fit into that in a major way well until the last couple of years i would have said yes and i still say we'll have the capability to find signs of life on another exoplanet but as more and more people work on this we're seeing just how confusing and tangled it is and it's going to be very hard to sort through what is a real signature of life and i know jill has known this forever you know but and mm -hmm. what is not and it's not clear if we'll all agree or come to consensus but you know web is the, our first shot at it and we'll just have to wait and see if nature delivered. Do you do you think it will? I, it's going to be tough. The Trappist planets, we all love them. They're our favorites. There's a few more favorites, but it depends what the planets have to offer and whether or not the James Webb can perform uh, where it's where it's at. But we'll see. I mean, you have to understand. Part of it is the excitement of the journey. You know, we've been working on this the whole time and finding new things. And yeah, we're all where all the whole community is waiting for, for the James Webb to launch. I don't sure think the pressure's are. on us, actually. I think we're, we're good. There's lots of people in the field now. Lots of people know how to do the science. The James Webb team has made it easy for us. I think Amy's the one feeling pressure. I mean, it's tough. It's got to be a tough job. Uh, that's that's why we've saved. Here, so uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it launching, too. Well, we should, well, I'm, I'm gonna get to you in one second, Amy, because I wanna talk about that pressure. But Maggie, I wanna ask you, um, sort of picking up on, on, on what we've heard so far, you know, are we close? And, and the question too, is that one of the things you say in the film is you say, um, we're standing in a, in, a, uh, in a sports shop actually, 
which for those of you who haven't seen the film, it, it ranges widely across the country and across the world, in fact. And there's a wonderful scene in an archery shop where you're picking up a bow and arrow um, in Wisconsin, and you're having a great discussion with the person behind the counter. Um, and he asks you, do you think there's life out there? And you say, you know, with all the stars out there, you know, it's just impossible to believe that, that we're the only place where there's life in the universe and everything else is a sterile rock. Um, do, you, do you feel that? Are we close? Are we going to find it? Are we going to find life? Is it there and are we gonna find it soon? I feel confident that there is life out there. I mean, it, it's kind of incomprehensible to me that we would just have only one planet uh, of, of what we know are definitely billions of planets in, at habitable temperatures throughout our one galaxy um, that, could, that could hold life. But I, I also, I feel less confident about us actually finding uh, life and knowing that for sure um, in the sometime soon. Uh, that, that I feel less confident about. I think it is a tangly problem. And, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, we can be on the verge of that for an indefinitely long time. <laughs> I mean, our capability is close, um, but nature has to really cooperate and, uh, and the odds are, are not really in our favor right now, given the capabilities that we're going to have in the next decade or two. Well, my fingers are crossed and my hope is that a film like this can have some impact. You know, if we have the collective will, we can do anything. You know, and if the if the if we spend the money on it, and we want it as a global community, which I think we do, we we can we can move faster. Which which sort of I, I believe. Which brings me to you, Amy. You know, Web is a is a game changer instrument. It's um you know it's uh, can you just tell me for a moment why this telescope that we see behind you um, sort of opens the gateway? Well, first of all, let me ask you a little bit about the stress that you feel. When we see it, we see in the film, we see the telescope going together and you are in charge on that day as the alignments lead of actually making sure all the parts line up. And you've spent a lot of your career on this. What is the stress like for you to see Webb coming, you know, when you're in charge of those things? And also, um, can you just tell me how it is a bit of a game changer as an instrument for finding life and other things too, for looking at other targets as well. Sure. Um, let's see, uh, the, the stress. Uh, you know, I, I knew coming into this job, uh, it would be uh, holding the expectations of a generation of astronomers uh, on our shoulders. The good news is I'm not alone. There is an enormous team of both engineers and scientists, and we kind of all work together and uh, uh, I guess carry the burden together. Um, uh, honestly, the, the best way to deal with it is uh, to be prepared. So, you know, we work hard, we do our analysis, we uh, uh, try to um, foresee every single event that could happen in contingency and make plans and execute them. Um, and uh, hopefully the result is an extremely successful mission. Um, as to why Webb uh, is able to do this, I mean, I, <laughs> I think, uh, my uh, fellow panelists can answer that better than I can, but you know, for kind of the audience out there that you know may not have the uh, kind of depth of science background, uh, one way to think about Webb, and uh, I have it on pretty good authority, uh, that uh, if you put Webb on the Earth, uh, it can detect a child's nightlight on the moon, um, detect the heat signature of uh, a bumblebee. I think he actually said a specific species of bumblebee that I can't remember which it is. Um, so it is extremely powerful. Um, now, whether or not nature cooperates is another thing, but I feel that we are doing our best here. Certainly, you know, uh, I am to uh, make the dream happen for uh, these folks out there. And, and Webb really is a game changer instrument too, right? Because it's the first fully deployable telescope in space. And doesn't it open the way to building other larger deployable <laughs> telescopes in space? It is. It's the first segment in a deployable telescope uh, that we built in space. And, you know, um, to give you an idea of why it was necessary, traditional fairings for where you launch rockets are about five meters wide. And if you wanted mirrors that were larger than five meters, you would have to make them be able to deploy. And in order to do that, you'd have to uh, most likely segment them. 
and then deploy them. In addition to which, you have to sync up all of the near elements once you're on orbit. And I'm just going to demonstrate all of that and uh, uh, once you know it launches. So really, it's kind of I feel like it's step one, um, a continuum of hopefully lots and lots of telescopes that will be launching in the future that you know carry either similar architect. We need to move as quickly as we can. And and Jill, I, I come to you and I think you know for those of you out there who who um, who um, have seen contact, which I assume is almost everybody. I hope if if you haven't seen it, go see it right away. Uh, Jill Tarter is the is the model for the character played by Jodie Foster in the film Contact, and her work has inspired generations of scientists and generations of enthusiasts and also science fiction writers for years. Jill, you 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 have behind you the Allen array, um, which is an array that you're you, in Hat Creek that we film you at in the film, and you know you've you've worked in multiple areas not just the optical but also the, those are radio telescopes behind you um so you've been searching for extraterrestrial intelligence and and signals from from elsewhere are we close are we going are we going i do do you feel that if we if we keep looking we're going to find it i, I mean we've looked for a while is it is it out um, there We've only looked for the blink of an eye in terms of cosmic timescales. Um, the, the, over my career, extremophiles and exoplanets have made the cosmos appear potentially more bio-friendly than when we started, but we don't know that it actually is. And so we have to get away from what we believe, what we'd like to believe, and just do the exploration in order to find out what is. And I'd like to suggest um, to Sarah and Natalie and Maggie that there is a way that we could maybe cut down the ambiguity that might go along with the TRAPPIST-1 system. And that might be that when we get the ability to image them, we find out that two or three or four of them are all identical. They shouldn't be. They should be at different temperatures because they're at different distances between from their star. But maybe there has been some enormous astroengineering that's gone on to transform these planets into real estate that some technological civilization prefers. Mm. So I'm eager to see what we image on the TRAPPIST-1 system, another type of techno signature perhaps. We're so close, only several months away before we launch and I know TRAPPIST will be a major target, right? It is something that is going to be looked at closely. Um, one of the things we talk about in the film is a question that all of you engaged in one way or another, and it became very important to us in making it, which is really this idea of the challenge of surviving the emergence of technology. Um, we have many challenges on this earth right now, and if we do find planet B, you know, how are we going to get there? How how will we can you know can we survive this this time in which we really are find ourselves challenged in many ways? What what are the what are there some answers that or or some directions that maybe emerge from the work that you are all doing? Um, anyone want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's really important to clean up this planet. Um, I think that's the first challenge, right? Because if we can't do that, then we're just going to take our mistakes with us and do it again somewhere else. So I think we need to figure out a way to cooperate globally, to uh, step up to these challenges and find solutions right here. Mm. Yeah. Um, Natalie? And doing, I mean, doing science and running these big projects that are international, that are global is, is really the training grounds for doing that. Um, but, but I was just going to say that when we're looking for life, we have to think about the limits of planetary habitability. And when you do that, you learn something about Earth. So there's a very practical outcome to the search for life, which circles back to Earth and helps us understand how to sustain life right here at home. So that's a practical output. Um, more touchy-feely is the fact that when you go out and explore and you think about other worlds and you, you spend all of this time contemplating all of these other places, you, you can't help at the end of the day but realize how precious life is and, and to love this planet all the more. 
Um, so, so that's a very important consequence as well, because it gives us the impetus, the inspiration to sustain life here on planet Earth, not just for our own survival in the long term, but just because of the beauty of life and as, as the pinnacle of complexity in the universe. Mm. Do you think about that, Maggie, as you, I mean, you spend a lot of time in nature. Um, yeah. We have great scenes with you canoeing and in, in the film, you, you're you quite engaged with the natural world. And do you, does, does your work with looking at other worlds reflect on, on, on your feelings about our world and where we, where we are right now? I mean, it's just one continuous thing. You know, nature is, it's here, it's on earth, it extends throughout the whole universe. And um, understanding that whole picture seamlessly is what we're really after there's not really it's not a real separation it's not like we have earth and then everything else everything is interconnected and the whole universe including our planet is embedded in this network of relationships that we are trying to discover as scientists and there are a lot and and that is edifying on a deep soul level for a lot of people to do that kind of work there are many, many traditions that hold, if you, if you really value something, you really appreciate it and you have gratitude for it, then you might be worthy of receiving more. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to value what we have and really understand it, you know, try to understand it, um, both from a, from a heart, a place of real heart and, and from the head, you know, that we understand how this works and we can interact with our environment in an intelligent and heartfelt way so that we can not only sustain our own survival, but all of the living beings around us that have value as well. You know, and, then, and then let's talk about exploring you know, the rest of the universe and see, see what else there is out there, if nothing else, just for the sheer appreciation of it. Wonderful. Well said. <laughs> Sarah, well said. Sarah, I, I, what would it mean for us if we discovered life out there? What would it mean for us down here? Well, it would show that we're not alone. And I think it would drive home that beautiful, eloquent point that Maggie just described, that we're somehow all interconnected. The ingredients for life are out there. And I think most of us think there is life out there. It's just a matter of, of time. And do you think it would change us if we, if, I mean, would, would, it, would it change us if we, if we knew life existed beyond the earth? It will definitely change many of us. Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll change every single human on this planet, but for a lot of us, it will just show that there's huge, there's sort of the, the vast unknown becomes a little less unknown. Amy, do you think do you think we'll find it in our life? Let me ask you, what, why do you think we are looking for life beyond Earth? And what will it, do you think we'll find it? Um, I, I think we'll find it. I think it's a matter of time, like Sarah and you know, other folks have been saying. Um, why? Well, so in the film, my answer was a little bit strange, um, but I, I think it's still true. I think we have, I think anyways, uh, we're lonely and uh, um, the number one is, is pretty singular. Um, it'd be great if we had other examples uh, of life out there and that somehow we can form some statistics or some knowledge of why and how life forms. Um, I, I think ultimately really it leads to intelligent life. You know, uh, I think that as, as more of a lay person than, <laughs> than the other folks on this panel are, um, uh, Intelligent life would be a spectacular thing. To find. It sure would. It sure would. And we have eight seconds. Okay. So please check out the Hunt for Planet B. Stay tuned as the Webb Telescope gets ready to launch. Thank you and good night.